Boom. Greetings all. Last Outrider here bringing you the next part of the end times. This time, the end is the beginning, is the end. The world was dying, but it had long been so, ever since the coming of the Dark Gods. For years, beyond human reckoning, the gods had coveted the physical realm, had sought to infect it with their madness. They had sent demonic legions to conquer it by force, seduced mortals to their cause with honeyed words and the temptations of glory. Even the physicality of the mortal world warped under their influence their magical lifeblood corrupting the soil and the air, until no living thing escaped their touch. Many times did the Dark Gods breach the barrier between the realms, but each time heroes arose to confront the madness through deeds of valor and sacrifice. The demonic legions were cast back into the blasphemous realms that had sired them, and for those mortals who had fallen into the Dark God's grasp, were slain or driven out into the wilderness. Alas, these victories were fleeting, for the Dark Gods are eternal, and mortal fortitude all too brief. Each time, the cycle soon began again, heralded by a twin-tailed comet in the northern skies. Each time the gods retreated, so too did magic recede. As the barrier between the realms healed, yet these wounds never truly closed, and the mortal realm was never truly free of the god's magic or the strife that came with it. As the millennia passed, great nations arose from amidst the strife, bastions of order in a world awash with chaos. However, though these realms were strong without they were hollow within, for they were maintained by hatred and distrust, ruled through pride and fear. Such emotions were as the meat and drink to the gods, and they feasted in defeat almost as greedily as they did in victory. The mortals unknowingly crafted their own downfall, for even their triumphs hastened their inevitable doom. Thus, as a twin-tailed comet was again seen in mortal skies, the dark gods flexed their husbanded right once more. The barrier between the realms fractured, and the trickle of magic into the world became a flood. Storms of roiling, unadulterated chaos swept across the mortal realm, lashing the lands with arcane fury. Blood fell as rain, seething and searing wherever it touched living flesh. The skies and fields blazed with multicolored fire, the clouds and stars twisting into leering faces to witness the fall of civilization. Hmm. Proud cities that had stood for hundreds of years collapsed into fetid squalor, as the water they relied upon for life turned black and noxious. 
everywhere, mortals were overcome by selfish desire and wanton impulses, throwing themselves into the most obscene and blasphemous of acts. The storms spread quickly, for neither mountain nor ocean could stay their passage. From out of these maelstroms marched the demonic legions, loosed once more to wreak havoc their master's vengeance upon the world. While the demons of corn wrought their bloody carnage, Zinch's emissaries pulled upon the interwoven schemes thousands of years in the making, reveling in how the mortals danced at the strands shifted and unraveled at their touch. Nurgle's plagues blossomed and spread, ushering mortals into fevered deaths. But even then, it was whispered that the Plague Father had ordered the creation of a pestilence that would outshadow all that can come before it. And Slanesh's handmaidens, they too acted it according to their nature, bestowing upon mortals joys so rare and exquisite that the death they granted quickly afterwards was both the kindest and cruelest of acts. The world over, mortals prayed with a fervor that they had never before known. Some prayed to the dark gods, and so surrendered their souls to the blackness. Others prayed to their own sainted deities, and these walked with hope and disappointment. For the final fleeting days, for the other gods had faded as the chaos gods had arisen. In every city of every land, seers, madmen, and prophets spoke of the end times, of the fiery doom of the world brought nigh. Even the boldest felt a friction of fear to hear those words pronounced, and they hoped that the portents would yet prove false. Discord broke out amongst the blasphemous ranks, for the demons of the different gods were as varied in character as the deities that had spawned them. In many places, the demons forgot the mortals altogether and turned upon one another, transforming great reaches of the world into hellish battlegrounds where the slights and insults of millennia were at last repaid. The gods cared not, for their appetite was vast, and their palates simple. Strife was strife, and it mattered not from which fields the harvest of suffering was reaped. The gods supped of the heady brew their minions had created, and grew stronger for the tasting. And as the gods' might swelled, so too did the woes unleashed upon the world increase. However, victory yet eluded the gods' grasp. For though the tides of chaos were rising, they were not yet at their height. Many storms of magic collapsed as suddenly as they broke banishing the demons once more to their distant realm. The hold of 
Kazak Izar was besieged and battered by such a tempest. Its defenders assailed by a vast legion of blood-starved demons that they fought on only from defense, from defiance, with no hope of victory. Then, without warning, the storm shattered upon the winds, replaced in an instant by blue skies. The bewildered dwarves, their mail rent and shields dented, were left staggered, unsure whether to maintain their shield walls or bury their dead. Elsewhere, the river Anvir turned to blood and birthed a slathering host that overran every town and village along its banks. Only Averheim survived the onslaught, and then only because the demons faded within moments of reaching its walls. Alas, seldom did suffering end with the demon's departure. When the maggot king Epiv Epidivimus brought his festival of disease to Middenheim, Pak's scarred victims were sent to the fires long after this fly swathed host that had departed the packed streets. Even after the lurid flames ceased writhing over Tor Akhar, crackling demons hunted the nightmares of all who slept within the city's bounds, and many such dreamers never awoke, their souls stolen away from their slumbering bodies. In Tilia, the town of Trantio was, for three days and three nights, engulfed in a swirl of perfumed murk. No two stones lay together when the storm lifted. The demon-wrought destruction was so complete that not a single building survived, and every soul trapped now served. In manners both horrific and diverse, before Slanesh's silken throne. In many places, the breaches between the realms were larger and more stable, and were fraught the bloodiest battles of those days. In Lustria, the vast rift in the heart of Jahutek was torn open anew. Although the lizardmen had long prepared for that moment, and had surrounded the ancient ruins with troops and wards, the onslaught was only contained, not defeated. As the days of unrelenting battle ground on, the Saurus cohorts were gradually driven back. In Ulthuan, Yavresi was all but overrun as the demon Inkari led his legions forth from the enchanted mists to bring suffering to the High Elves once more. In Ethelorin, the vaults of winter cracked asunder and spewed legions of demon kind into the glades of Summerstrand. Yet all these accursions were as nothing compared to what occurred at the world's northern pole. At the sight of the greatest rift between mortal and immortal realms. There, the demon legions congregated 
in numbers beyond measure. Marshalling into four great hosts of damnation, assembled beneath the most exalted servants of the chaos gods. It was an invasion of a magnitude not seen for thousands of years. The beginning of the end. A declaration of the death of the world. One by one, the four exalted demons bent knee in fealty, not to a god or to another demon, but to a mortal man, a traitor to his kind, chosen by the dark gods to be their agent of annihilation. For the acts he would perform, so had the gods named him. He was Archeon, ever chosen, Lord of the end times. And the hour of his glory was fast approaching. The coming of the demons heralded a time of dark rejoicing for the barbarians of the chaos wastes. For long months, the shamans and seers of the northern tribes had read signs of glory in the stars and omens in the shifting winds. The black moon hung heavier in the skies with each day. Green flames raging across its surface and sparkling into the void. Waves of dark blessings rippled through the tribes with every flare. A twin-tailed comet blazed across the sky, its wake branding the heavens with the sigils of flickering fire. Tidings spread that Archeon had at last ascended to his throne of bone and brass. The crown of damnation set upon the ever-chosen's brow by unholy Belakor, the first damned. Truly, as Archeon, the lord of the end times, highest in the sight of the chaos gods, and their weapon against the world. Such was the ever-chosen's glory. Or so it was said, that even the immortal servants of the gods now offered him fealty. Not all believed that the demons intended true allegiance to the ever-chosen. For the legends of the Northlands were replete with the tales of how such creatures obeyed only when it served their interests. But it hardly mattered. There would be opportunities for the strong, the devious, and the devoted to win favor from the gods. Tribes beyond counting were drawn north to the inevitable city. Their chieftains, driven by ambition to kneel before Archeon's grim throne. As each night fell, and the dark moon blazed overhead, drums boomed through the darkness, bellowed chants echoed south across the waste. Tens of thousands of voices raised in guttural clamor, all who heard that ancient prayer felt something impossibly old and hungry stir in their souls. Lunatics, seers, and demon-touched wanderers found their steps guided northwards by unknown compulsion or by the insidious whispers dancing in their minds. 
As the winds carried the dirge south across the old world, even the faultless souls who had never heard the call of the dark powers felt its summons. A few, too few, resisted, drawing upon the strength of dwindled gods to preserve their fragile sanity. Some went mad scooping out their eyes so that they might blind themselves to their unwanted visions, or hacking out their tongues to keep from uttering blasphemous truths. Others welcomed the changes that were upon them, sensing at last the fulfillment of a need they had never before acknowledged. In Britonia, in the great cathedral of Gresseru, a bishop was suddenly compelled to anoint the lady's fountain with the slime of his own blackened sores. As contagion rippled through the pilgrims who drank from the waters, he bellowed with laughter, a terrible, blood-choked sound that gave out only when his lungs collapsed beneath the weight of the writhing maggots within. In Altdorf, a sister of Shalia completed her morning devotions, took up a carving knife from the refectory, and slaughtered those within. People who ha she had lived with and worshipped for, with, for two decades. When the city watch finally breached the temple a day later, they found her sitting amongst bloody and half-eaten bodies. The captain of the watch made the mistake of thinking her comatose. Soon, he had a ragged gash where his throat would have been, and she had a sword as well as a knife. Thus began a trial of carnage that stretched to the border of troll country and ended at last in a hail of Bullets somewhere on the Nordvast Streckheim Road. All across the old world, soldiers turned on their comrades before fleeing into the beastmen haunted forests or north into the chaos wastes. Humanity slowing from their own minds and bodies with every step they took. Hour by hour, day by day, Archeon's army grew, its numbers swollen by traitors and madmen from the south. Yet still, the ever-chosen made no move to march, Many chieftains grew restless. They chafed at the inactivity and longed to rise their axes against the weak nations of the world. Some warred amongst themselves, but others led their tribes south in search of plunder and victory. Archeon cared not. The horde could not be controlled. He knew that well enough. But it did not matter. The eye of Shirian had granted him a vision of the future, of a world swallowed by fire in which civilization had crumbled and every voice exalted to the glory of the chaos gods. This future was not to be brought about by war as the civilized world had so far seen it. This would be war without end. 
the realm of chaos was rising. And those not swept away at its onset would drown as the dark waters closed over their heads. Let others be the first to break upon the shore, expending their strength before the full swell of the tide. Let the weak and the worthless be winnowed out. Let the reckless and glory mad grind themselves to offal against the defenses long prepared. They were of no consequence. Those who survived would be stronger for it. Those who perished would glorify the gods with their deaths. Soon, the swords of chaos would rise. Archeon's banner and the greatest horde ever seen would march to seize history itself. The end times were upon the world, and Archeon's hour was nigh. <laughs> so there you go. That was a long story. I didn't want to break it up into parts. I hope you're not bothered by that. But that is the end, is the beginning, is the end. Until next time. Bye.